From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Conflicting reports at McCain Institute Executive Director Kurt Volker's job status in flux. We'll bring you the very latest. Plus, the controversial film Joker is making its debut across the country this weekend, but its storyline is prompting concern and strict rules at some theaters, including right here in Arizona. And we take an in-depth look at why there isn't more diversity among high school football coaches in Arizona. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Ellie Nakamoto-White. And I'm Anthony Totri. Thanks for joining us. Our big story tonight, Kurt Volker telling staff at ASU's McCain Institute he'll stay on as their director for now. But a McCain Institute official said trustees there are discussing what's best for the institute going forward. Volker's meeting with staff came amid news reports he might resign a day after he spent 10 hours testifying before House investigators in an impeachment inquiry. Those committees are looking into whether President Donald Trump pushed Ukrainian officials to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden, a possible Trump challenger in 2020, and whether Volker was an intermediary between White House and Ukrainian officials. The Ukrainian charges were first reported by a White House whistleblower, which made a recent discussion about whistleblowers a hot topic, as Heather Cumblage reports from our Washington Bureau. President Donald Trump has his own opinion about the whistleblower, whose report sparked an impeachment inquiry. The whistleblower was so dishonest. Uh, this is a uh, fraudulent crime on the American people. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who announced the impeachment, has her. The intelligence community recognizes the importance of whistleblowers. Protecting whistleblowers who see wrongdoing of any kind in our government is essential. At a panel in Washington this week, experts said it's a little of both. Arizona State University business ethics professor Marion Jennings told the Cato Institute audience that whistleblowers come in different varieties, not all of them sincere. There are other people who just look at it and say, this just isn't right and I can't live with that. So those are the true whistleblowers. You also have whistleblowers who do it for a living. It's the ones who do it for political or monetary gain who tarnish the reputation of those who do it for their conscience. I think they cost the credibility of the sincere ones. Those mm. two groups cost the credibility. The White House whistleblower complained to intelligence officials about the report of Trump's July 25th call to the new Ukrainian president. In that call, Trump asks Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden a potential Trump rival in the 2020 election. Trump and his supporters accused the whistleblower of peddling secondhand information, but one panelist said whistleblowers are not required to have firsthand information, and so far the report has stood up. Well, when this whistleblower made their disclosure, the intelligence community inspector general conducted a preliminary review of that disclosure. And that means they interviewed witnesses, they reviewed documents, and every single witness that the intelligence community inspector general interviewed to de eventually determine that the disclosure was credible is also, in fact, a whistleblower. Jennings, a Trump supporter, said she's concerned that the impeachment inquiry may be moving too fast. But House members yesterday began taking depositions in their case, and they said the anonymous whistleblower has agreed to testify. In Washington, Heather Cumberledge, Cronkite News. Democratic presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke is visiting Arizona Sunday. It will be the first time he's made a stop in our state since joining the 2020 presidential race. According to his campaign, O'Rourke plans to talk about the treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers by the Trump administration. Meanwhile, Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs is looking into stricter cybersecurity measures ahead of the 2020 election. After collecting public comments, Hobbs made several changes to a draft elections manual. New provisions clarify language to require the use of encryption with voter data, as well as ending reuse of USB sticks for transferring files. Another change specifies voter rolls can be used for nonpartisan voter outreach. Now the draft manual says county recorders have to coordinate with sheriff's offices to make sure eligible voters in pre-trial detention or serving time for misdemeanors are able to cast a ballot. Security has stepped up across the country as the Joker movie opens in the U.S. this weekend. The DC Comics villain has been associated with the 2012 Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting ever since false claims linked the character to the shooter. Now there are fears the new film could spark similar violence. 
Cronkite News reporter Ricky Cornish is joining us live now with what theaters in Arizona are doing to ensure safety. Ricky? Yeah, Anthony, movie theaters in Phoenix are taking extra security measures for the opening of Joker. The Phoenix Police Department and movie theaters are following proper protocol to make sure no threats of violence come to fruition. All I have are negative thoughts. It's the dark, twisted fantasy that Batman fans love, but it's no laughing matter when it comes to security. Local theaters across the valley are cracking down to prevent any life-threatening situations. Harkins movie theaters are requiring bag checks at their doors. Moviegoers are not allowed to cover or obscure their faces by wearing masks or face paint. Patrons cannot bring bags larger than backpacks, including large purses. Cinemark theaters will put up additional signs enforcing their bag policy. No bag bigger than 12 by 12 by 6 dimensions will be allowed in. Police officers and managers will also be monitoring during showtimes. Nothing has uh, been brought to our attention. We have not received any type of credible threats. Local theaters do hire um, off-duty police officers to provide security at some of their facilities. At these points, we've never experienced anything uh, with theaters, but there's nothing wrong by uh, being just being careful in, uh, and reporting any, any suspicious activity of any kind. Although masks and face paint are not allowed, Harkins Theaters does welcome some costumes for the ultimate Batman fans. In the Broadcast Center, Ricky Cornish, Cronkite News. Mountain Point High School's varsity football coach, Rich Welbrock, has had his hands full the past couple weeks as he's had to juggle the ongoing football season along with a recent scandal that's taken over his program. Just two weeks ago, Justin Hager, a teacher and coach at Mountain Point High, was suspended from the school for sharing classified information with opposing teams. The now-fired coach was allegedly sending his team's game plans to the opposition for most of the past two years. His motives are still unknown, and right now, Coach Walbrock and the team are still sorting through what they feel is a betrayal. Playbook for this. Uh, it's one of those things that we've talked to our kids, we've, we've stepped certain kids away to see how they're feeling about it. But the biggest thing is, is it's just adversity. Um, and how do we fight through that? And, and, you know, one of the things I've always said, even after a tough loss, if this is the worst thing that happens in our lives, we're going to be fine. Hager has 10 days to appeal his firing. Meanwhile, the team will continue the last half of the season without him. Chandler High School, Coolidge, Mesquite, Brophy, Verado, just a few high schools across the valley with one thing in common. Over the last few years, they made a head coaching change. Another similarity, the newly hired head coach was white. I took a deeper look at how and why certain coaches aren't being hired. Out of the 16 football teams in the 2018 6A playoffs, not a single one had an African-American head coach. With districts and administrations responsible for the hiring process, Scott Brooks, director of research at Arizona State's Global Sport Institute, says the issue of coach diversity goes far beyond winning and losing. Let's focus and let's do it. All coaches of color are primarily defensive, and that goes back historically to ideas and theories around stacking where you have players are stacked into positions based upon race and ethnicity. Now, Brooks said historically players of color have been pushed to outside positions that reflect more athleticism, whereas white players are brought to the positions that require more critical thinking, such as quarterback, center, and middle linebacker. But when it comes time to hang up the cleats and start coaching, well, it's the players who were once credited as being thinkers that become head coaches. Skyline on three, one, two, three. Skyline! Skyline head coach George Hawthorne is one former non-quarterback who did manage to get hired, and his only request is equality. I, I just want equal ground. So when I go interview, I want to interview on equal ground. I don't want to interview on higher ground. I don't want to interview on lower ground. I want to interview on equal ground. I want George Hawthorne to speak for George Hawthorne. And when Hawthorne does speak for himself, he wants it to be about more than his playing experience. I really believe that the game has a lot to offer. And it's not about the score on Friday night. It's not about the touchdowns that a kid may score. It's about the life lessons that a kid gets from this game. So what's the solution to systemic racism on the field? Well, David Hines, the executive director of the Arizona Interscholactic Association, outlined the issue. As I look around the state, we tend to be more Caucasian. 
uh, in some of these positions, whether it's at the superintendency level, principal level, athletic director level, coaches. And Brooks has the possible solution. I think you have to have more athletic directors of color. You have to have more women of women and women of color in these positions in sports. So we've got to create more and more openings. We're joined now by Ricky Cornish for this week's weather report. Ricky, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about you guys? Doing great. Good, how you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Ricky, on the topic of high school sports, there's a lot of high school sporting events, specifically tonight, football games. What can parents and families kind of expect for the weather tonight? They can expect to sweat. <laughs> no, it's, it's still hot here in Arizona. It's going to be hot this weekend, but let's talk about the temperatures across the state. As we can see right here in Phoenix, it is so hot. I cannot believe it's actually 93 degrees outside right now. But if you're trying to get away from the heat, just go up the state. Take a little road trip and go up to Flagstaff. It's 68 degrees right there right now, so go out and enjoy those temperatures. But if you're looking to stay in Phoenix for the weekend and you're wondering what to do tonight, well, I have you covered. As we can see right now at 7 p.m., it's 89 degrees, but then lower tonight, it's going to be 80s. So what a relief that we're finally getting out of the 90s, out of the triple digits. But if you're wondering, okay, the temperatures are a little bit nicer, not too hot, what should I do? Well, let's talk about some weekend of events. As we can see, Arizona State Fair opens today and it's going to last the entire month. It actually ends on my birthday, which is a little fun fact. But if you're looking for something to do tonight here in downtown Phoenix, we have first Friday right on Roosevelt Row. So go eat some food, enjoy some art and have some fun. And then tomorrow night, Jonas Brothers are going to be at Talking Stick Resort Arena. Say hello. I'm going to be out front, probably giving away some t-shirts and eating some food. So come say hello. Now, if you're wondering what to do for the rest of the weekend and what the temperatures are looking like here at our seven day forecast, as we can see, high temperatures Monday, a high of 99, and it's going to be high 80s by Friday. In the Weather Center, Ricky Cornish, Cronkite News. Coming up next, Cronkite News in Review. We take a look back at some of our top stories from earlier this week, including how survivors are continuing to heal two years after the Las Vegas massacre and a look back at the life and legacy of former Arizona Cardinals owner Bill Bidwell, who passed away Wednesday. Welcome back to Cronkite News and Review. One of our top stories this week, the two year anniversary of the Las Vegas massacre. It's the deadliest shooting rampage in our nation's history. 58 people died at the Route 91 Music Festival when the gunman opened fire from his hotel room at the Mandalay Bay before turning the weapon on himself. Police recovered 23 assault style weapons from the shooter's room. And while the shooting opened another channel for the discussion of gun control, it also brings to light the mental health of those who live with the trauma of mass shootings in America. Cronkite News reporter Jenna Yanoni spoke with an Arizona man who survived the shootings about how he copes with the memory of that night. So today marks two years since that tragic day in 2017. With 58 lives lost and nearly 700 injured, healing can be a daunting concept. We spoke with survivors to talk about lingering mental health effects and the road to recovery. On October 1st, 2017, a gunman opened fire on a crowd of concert goers at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas, where 58 people lost their lives. Former Arizona resident Justin Uhart saved Jan Lanborn's life. Now, the two have a relationship like no other. I'm not really a talkative person about it, but when she's around, I do talk about it. and. Uh... We definitely open up to each other because we had such a dramatic, you know, 12 hours together that we will always remember for the rest of our lives. Uhar and Lamborn treated themselves to steak and whiskey at dinner last night in Las Vegas. This morning, they picked up flowers and paid a visit to the Healing Gardens, a memorial dedicated to the victims and recovery. She's alive, and we are able to walk around and hold hands during that, um, just on the path during the, uh, Mental health care is crucial for recovery. The National Center for PTSD estimates that 28% of people who have witnessed a mass shooting get diagnosed with PTSD. 
A mental health counselor says that shootings leave a long-term mental imprint. In the very beginning, and you know, for a lot of trauma survivors, they go, I'm never going to be normal again. I'm never going to be able to go to a concert or go to a big public event without thinking about how terrified I am of where are the exits? Are these people safe? Who am I with? What can I use to protect myself? Um, so that takes a really long time to overcome. And, and that small exposure that kind of comes with being able to bring yourself back to environments like that in a more protected way. As for you, Hart, well, he's making strides towards healing. The last two years, I didn't go to the uh, Las Vegas White Crosses last night, and I went. Um, it was really nice and very humbling, but um, it's, it's still very emotional time of year, for sure. But two years after the carnage, some questions remain unanswered. In January, the FBI announced that it was ending its investigation into the massacre. The agency was unable to determine the motive, meaning that we may never know what prompted one of the darkest days in modern U.S. history. In the Broadcast Center, I'm Jenny Anoni for Cronkite News. Arizona is the fastest growing state in the nation. That's according to the U.S. Census Bureau's 2018 American Community Survey. It estimates Arizona's population grew by 2.2 percent last year. That's the largest percentile increase of any other state. Arizona's total population grew by about 155,000 people from 2017 to 2018. For perspective, that growth in a single year is equal to about one quarter of the entire population of Wyoming. The executive director of the Maricopa Association of Governments telling Cronkite News 65 to 70 percent of the overall state growth occurred in Maricopa and Penal counties. One major challenge of keeping up with this kind of growth is ensuring Arizona's transportation infrastructure can handle the swelling population, which will take money. And the state hasn't changed its gas tax since 1991. It's been 18 cents a gallon. And so the purchasing power of that has certainly declined. And so we're going to have to look uh, with, uh, with our uh, colleagues at the state level what we can do to augment those resources at the state level. Here in the Valley, there's a dedicated sales tax that's able to keep up with infrastructure needs. This week, we also told you about a cannabis chamber of commerce created with one mission to make recreational marijuana legal here in Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Mariah Gallegos has some insight into how the new chamber plans to do that. It's a fight nearly 10 years in the making. In 2010, Arizona voters joined the other states in legalizing the use of medical marijuana with Prop 203. Then in 2016, the Arizona Marijuana Legislation Initiative was on the ballot, but Prop 205 was defeated. The next year, another initiative was started. Paperwork for the Safer Arizona Cannabis Act was filed, but it didn't get enough valid signatures to get on the ballot. Now, the latest initiative. Smart and Safe Arizona submitted its paperwork to the state's Legislative Council for a legal analysis and review. The deadline is July 2nd of 2020. The referendum needs 237,645 signatures from registered voters to qualify for the ballot. The Arizona Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, also known as AZC3, wants to bring change to the Smart and Safe Arizona proposed initiative to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. The goal for the Arizona Cannabis Chamber of Commerce is to pro promote professionalism and ethics across the industry as well as to support small businesses in the marijuana space. Susan Wang is the CEO of a national portfolio of cannabis brands. She believes the mix of professions which make up the group can better serve the community. There are attorneys and there are accounting firms, there is a payment solutions, there is banking, there is um, other experts with the certification and laboratories that are involved. And that's actually what we need in Arizona, the diversity. Because how can you let just the dispensary owners to decide the fate of adult use here in Arizona? If the legislation is passed, Arizona would join the District of Columbia and 11 other states highlighted in bright green, which have legalized marijuana for recreational use. 
AZC3 is not against the recreational use of marijuana in Arizona, but they are pushing for changes to the proposed initiative. And if not, they will take their changes to the legislator. We know all the benefits this product from brought to uh, patients, especially our veterans with PTSD and mental illnesses. And we want to make sure that as many people get this product that need it, and also that they get it in a very safe uh, and healthy way. After speaking with members who attended the launch of AZC3, many believe after the 2016 initiative was defeated by just 2.64%, Arizona has a chance of becoming a recreational use state. Mariah Gallegos, Cronkite News. A new study by the Mayo Clinic is the first in the nation to examine lung tissue from people with vaping-related illnesses. The study examined 17 samples of lung tissue. All of the patients had vaped, with 71% of them vaping with cannabis oils. Two of the patients who contributed samples later died. What we see with these vaping cases is a kind of severe chemical injury that I've never seen before in a tobacco smoker or a traditional marijuana smoker. Uh, but I, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Over 800 cases of lung injuries linked to vaping have been reported to the CDC over the last few months. Sad news came midweek as Arizona Cardinals owner Bill Bidwell died. He passed away Wednesday, surrounded by his family and loved ones. A funeral mass will take place Tuesday morning at St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in Phoenix. Bidwell was part of the NFL family his entire life, starting from his days as a ball boy. Scotty Gange got reaction from the team earlier this week. Team owner Bill Bidwell passed away this morning at the age of 88. Now, Bidwell spent over eight decades with the Cardinals. Bidwell's life as a Cardinal began when his father Charles bought the team in 1932, where Bill rose from ball boy to owner. Now, Cards president and Bill's second oldest son, Michael Bidwell, said in a statement, quote, Our dad passed away today the same way he lived his life, peacefully, with grace, dignity, and surrounded by family and loved ones, end quote. Now, 16-year wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald and former Cardinals quarterback Jake Plummer shared their sentiments on the man simply known as Mr. B. I know there were numerous times sitting with him and talking uh, football. You know, he was a, a walking historian when it came to the game of football and, and where it started and how it's been built. And it was always been very intriguing and interesting to sit and talk with him. When, when I got here, he was still, you know, running things. And, you know, you know I would imagine the first pick overall in the draft, um, you know, had to have his blessing. And without his blessing, there's no way, you know, I would, I would have been here. And there's no telling what my career would have been if he didn't believe in me. In his lifetime with the Cardinals, Bidwell was as connected with the organization and the Sea of Red as anyone. And he will be deeply missed not only with the Cardinals, but with the Arizona community as a whole. From the newsroom, Scotty Gange, Cronkite News. You've got just a couple more weeks left to enjoy the Grand Canyon's North Rim. That's because the park will begin reducing services for the cold season starting October 16th. This includes everything from the lodge and restaurants to trails and shower facilities. Just one gift shop and gas station will offer limited services until May of next year. But don't worry, the canyon's more popular south rim stays open year-round. With temperatures cooling down, many Arizonans will find themselves hitting the trails. But now you can hit the trails on foot or a set of electric wheels thanks to the National Park Service. Cronkite News reporter Melanie Porter shares just where you'll find these desert riders. It is a change on our trails. Ray O'Neill doesn't think these bikes will have a big impact on Saguaro National Park. The vast majority of our trails do not allow traditional bikes and therefore don't allow electronic bikes with the new policy. But we do have several trails where um, traditional bikes were allowed and now electronic bikes will be allowed. E-bikes are gaining traction in Arizona, but Aaron Navarro saw some pushback when he took to the trails on an e-bike. And we actually had like a hiker um, to turn, take a second look at us and be like, oh, those guys aren't real mountain bikers. So there's definitely, even not just within cyclists, but kind of just in general, there is that kind of view that just because you're not pedaling as hard doesn't make you as good or something like that. But for James Lorenzen, he sees e-bikes becoming more popular among baby boomers who would prefer the ease and comfort that comes with electronic bikes. 
really all over the world. Uh, we're a little bit behind Europe by about six, seven years, and uh, we're seeing less and less people getting uptight with operating around e-bikes. What they're finding out is that they're just a regular bike. Now these bikes are allowed on trails within national parks. Some people are concerned about the potential environmental impact that e-bikes could have on the national parks. However, park rangers believe that if visitors are mindful and respect the previously established biking rules within the park, the environment will have little to no impact. The trails where we allow traditional bikes also allow hikers and horseback riders and now e-bikes. And if we start to see conflicts, we do have the opportunity to, to, to rein in one of those uses. As far as safety concerns, education and caution is key. We'll continue to, to educate and get folks to understand that our, our scenic drive, the biggest place that people come uh, to, to use bikes in the park is a great scenic drive, which means you're going nice and slow and you're enjoying the scenery. And enthusiasts are hoping that the industry will only pedal forward once people can fully experience the joy of e-bikes. In Tucson, Melanie Porter, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists Roundtable. The governor lashes out at a federal judge who ruled this week against Prop 123, and the vice president stops in Arizona to bolster Senator Martha McSally's campaign. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the news, our President Trump publicly urges China and Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. Coming up after Cronkite News and Arizona Horizon on Arizona PBS. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Have a great